Thank you for joining the Admiral's Almanac. We're taking a little bit of a pivot on the Admiral's Almanac, and I'm going to share with you some episodes from the Catholic Radio Network. Based on the response to my guests of Father James Kelleher, the amount of downloads from that and the interaction of the two of us, the Catholic Radio Network has asked us to uh, record a radio show for them. Father Kelleher, the Rosary Priest, and uh, Gary Hall, the Curious Catholic, are now appearing on the Catholic Radio Network, heard worldwide through the Internet or the Catholic Radio Network app. We appear on Gabriel 2 Network, 1130 Central Time in on Fridays, with a repeat of that show, Central Time Noon, on Sunday. Again, here's our first episode of the Catholic Radio Network, living in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity. I hope you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the Catholic Radio Network, carrying on the legacy of Deacon Dr. John Perk, and in his honor, we are adding a new weekly program to the Catholic Radio Network, living in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity. Your hosts are Father James Kelleher, internationally known as the Rosary Priest and lifelong friend of the deacon, and me, Rear Admiral Gary Hall, the Curious Catholic. Learn more about our Catholic faith, how to share the good news of our faith, and how to become the perfect saint on living in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity. Each week, we share the fruits of our Catholic faith so that you too will live in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity. And welcome Father James Kelleher. Good evening, Father. Hi, Gary. It's great to be here with you doing this wonderful show called Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity. That's what we're called to do. And all these beautiful saints have gone before us and they've done it. And they're going to help you and me and all of our listening audience to do the same. Because as St. Maximilian Kobe said, we're, we're not called just to be saints. We're called to be great saints. So this is going to be a great radio show. So, Father, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Deacon Dr. John Perk? Because uh, he recently passed, but I think he was well on his way to being a great saint. Can you tell us a little bit about Dr. John Perk and why we're doing this? The Deacon Dr. John Perk, God called him home at the age of 71 when he was still going full speed as a professor at the Creighton School of Dentistry in Omaha, Nebraska. He had been working there for five years, and prior to that, he'd worked for almost 35 years at the dental school in Kansas City, Missouri. But what characterized John Perk were some personal qualities. He was a father, a husband. He was a father of seven children, and now they're all adults. But he, anybody who's been a father knows that fatherhood takes a lot of work, and John gave himself to that work. He had a particular interest in each one of his children. And he especially was interested in helping to form them and living the Catholic faith. And so he really helped them do that. And then in his own personal life, he went to daily mass and he had a great love for Jesus in the Eucharist. And he realized that only in Jesus could he meet the challenges that he faced each day in his profession and in his family life. And so I think a lot of times he went to a mass that was at about seven in the morning so that he could get to work by eight. And he developed some of the key virtues, like he was a man of humility. He was a guy with a very bright intellect, and he had really high energy. He was always working to do more and to do it better. But he was trying to do it for the glory of God and not for the glory of John Perk. And that's part of what humility is, is living in the truth Whatever talents God has given to you and me, they've been given to us by God. We didn't create the talent. And so it's very important to start out first by thanking God for what he's given us and then asking God to show us how to develop it and to develop it in us as we cooperate with his grace. This makes such a big difference, Gary, because if we cooperate with God's grace, we will first give him glory. And that glory will then be manifested upon the people that we're working with so that they will desire to love God with their whole heart, mind, and soul 
and to use their gifts for his greater honor and glory and for the service of mankind. Amen. And being a, a dentist, a doctor, and a deacon, and an evangelist, he did great for his community, for his patients, and definitely for our faith. And I think that's why he was a long time host on the Catholic Radio Network. And as you said, we want to carry on his legacy now that he's been called home with our show, Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity. From the title, we learn a lot because it says, Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity. And our goal as Catholic Christians is to become one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, as daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Holy Spirit, she helps us to enter in to a deeper and deeper relationship with each person of the Most Holy Trinity. She helps us, through her power of intercession, to become not only a saint, but a great saint. And each one of us humbly, we want to give our best every day and be working at it every day, because that's the key to becoming a great saint, is work at it every day. So you're telling me that I, too, can become a great saint. Yes, indeed. And so really explain to our audience that they can become saints, that this is not being frivolous, but a true thing that they can become a saint. Right. The amazing thing is, Gary, is that each one of us have been created in the image and the likeness of God. So each one of us is very special in the eyes of God. God has a plan for each one of our lives. He wants us to be in communion with him. He wants us to become one with him. He wants us to open our hearts to his love. And that's how we become a great saint, is by receiving the love that the Father sends through the Son in the Holy Spirit. And this process of becoming a saint is a daily work. It doesn't happen in, a, in one day. It happens when we work at it every day. And one of the key words that we need in our vocabulary is surrender makes us responsive. And that's the key, is responding to God's guidance and to God's will, because that's what we want to do, His will. Yeah. And so, surrender, I think that's a beautiful uh, phrase, to surrender ourselves to God, to turn our lives over to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the Holy Trinity, there's the Holy Spirit. And I think what better way than to surrender ourselves is to share with our audience the Holy Spirit prayer. So, Father, you're famous for the Holy Spirit prayer, and it always yeah. works, and it always gets me going. So why don't, uh, we, why don't we do the Holy Spirit prayer so that we can surrender yes. uh, to our Lord? Yes. So I'll say a phrase, Gary, and you can repeat, and then all those out there listening can repeat also, because the Holy Spirit's at work in you. And so let us begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Holy Spirit, O Holy Spirit, soul of my soul, soul of my soul, I worship and adore you. I worship and adore you. Enlighten and guide, enlighten and guide. Strengthen and console me, strengthen and console me. Tell me what I ought to do. Tell me what I ought to do and command me to do it. And command me to do it. I promise to be submissive. I promise to be submissive in everything you permit to happen to me in everything you permit to happen to me. Only show me what is your will. Only show me what is your will. Amen. Amen. Fantastic. Now, Father, this is our first episode, and I was thinking that a great 27 minutes and 45 seconds, which we've been allotted, a great way to do that would be to maybe start off talking a little bit about our faith, and then maybe diving deeper into saints and other famous incidents in our Catholic faith, and then maybe wrap it up on how we can apply it to our everyday life. How does that sound to you? Sounds like a good approach. As the curious Catholic, and we are coming into our Eucharistic conference or council, and so I know that having read the statistics, a lot of people, even in sitting in the pews, aren't fully aware of the real presence of our Lord and Savior in the Eucharist. Can you talk about the importance of the Eucharist and what it really means and what it really is? Yes. We should probably start out with the Gospel of John, chapter 6, the Bread of Life 
discourse, where Jesus tells the disciples that unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have everlasting life. And so those are very powerful words of Jesus, and he's talking about actually receiving his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And how did he affect that for us? Because he's not on earth right now in his human form the way he was with his disciples. At the Last Supper, he instituted the Most Holy Eucharist. He took that bread at the Last Supper and said, take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body. And he took the chalice and said, take this all of you and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood. So Jesus gave us and gave the church the gift of his very self in the Eucharist at the Last Supper. And this is a gift that lasts for all time. And we have to return to the roots, to the scriptural roots of the Eucharist, and to have this fuller understanding, right? And we have to listen to the words of Jesus and let his words touch us, teach us, transform us. And then we have to make this, so we have to have the proper theological principles, and then we have to learn how to put that into action in our lives. Something that might help a lot of us is when we walk into the church, a Catholic church, we see the sanctuary lamp. It's lit. That's a sign that Jesus Christ is present in the tabernacle. A consecrated host is there. So that consecrated host, it looks like bread, but it's, that's only an appearance. The substance of that is the substance is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, which means Jesus Christ is there. He's the one who invites you and me to come and spend time with him. He's the one that wants to pour graces and blessings on us during our time with him. And when we come to celebrate the Most Holy Eucharist, as Catholics, we were called to go to Mass every Sunday, and many go even during the week because we want to get closer and closer to Jesus. When we come together publicly as a church and we participate in the Mass, and the priest consecrates the bread and wine, it becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Well, when we're receiving Jesus, he is making us deeper and deeper one with him. And he's uniting us all in his mystical body, which that's the call to love each other, right? Because we've first been loved by God. I can't love anybody unless I've been loved by God, right? And so it's the love of God at work in me that empowers me to love my neighbor. Some neighbors are easy to love. Other neighbors are harder to love, right? But we're called to love both our good neighbors and our not-so-good neighbors. That's the call of us as Catholic Christians. That's the call to become a saint. That is very powerful. And so it is the true presence, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if you're Catholic out there and you go to Mass routinely, but you're having trouble understanding, ask the Holy Spirit, help me understand, help me believe, help me become closer, help me love Jesus. And we should, as we approach uh, the Eucharist, we should do it joyfully. Just think that he's given his life for our sins. And so he's given us his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we need to go up there, not sorrowful, but with joy in our hearts. Father, thank you very much for that, helping us understand our Catholic faith. Let's talk into one of the saints. And I think, wouldn't it be great if we just laid a foundation for this show and talk about John Paul II, St. John Paul II, our lifelong Pope? Amen. He's a great one, Gary. He's arguably the greatest pope in the last 500 years and perhaps the greatest saint in the last 500 years. And by becoming spiritual friends with John Paul II and entering into the different aspects of his life, because he really did surrender to God, he can teach us how to surrender. He can teach us how to face adversity because he faced a lot of it in his life. So I think adversity that he faced, let's, why don't we on this show delve into his youth? Yeah, it, a lot of people aren't that aware of his youth. They have a general idea, but he was born in Vadovice, Poland, which is a suburb in, of Krakow, which is a major city in Poland. And so it's like a country suburb. And he had a beautiful father and mother that were very devout, but his mother died. Gary, when he's only eight years old. Oh, what a, a sensitive age, eight years old. Picture somebody eight years old in your life and uh, having their mother die. I, I can't, I don't know how he bore up under that. Yeah, he turned to the Blessed Mother 
and he poured his heart out to her, and he let the Blessed Mother pour her love into him. And that had a profound impact because it was a small town and the church was nearby. And so he could go to Mass daily. And he actually, this was a little practice he had, was he went to the Catholic school there, but it wasn't uncommon for some of his classmates to see him sneak into the chapel for just a one or two minute visit in between classes or at different points of the day. And because he just wanted to be close to God and just wanted to give everything to God. Now, he was an amazing uh, student. He was the brightest in his class, and he was also a good athlete. He was a soccer player. He played goalie, and he also liked to do acting, and he was quite an actor. He was the, the lead actor in a lot of the school plays. So John Paul II is a good example for our young people that if you love God and you let God touch your life, you let God guide you, you let God inspire you, you will use the gifts that he's given you to do beautiful things for God. God wants you to be a good student. If you're interested in athletics, he wants you to be a good athlete. If you're interested in being an actor he wants you, or actress, he wants you to be good at that. God wants us to use our gifts. That's why he gave them to us. And that's really fundamental because young people today, sometimes they're struggling to discover their gifts. And sometimes to discover your gifts, you just have to take a step back and Think about what you like to do and think about what you're good at and then pursue that and develop that. And as you do, as you utilize your gifts, don't do it just on, for your own advancement. Do it to give glory to God. Do it to give service to your brothers and sisters, right? Really, the great ones share their gifts and they share the honor that comes with what they achieve. Uh, I was recently talking with one of my mentors who's in his 80s, and he talked about helping teach his grandchildren to discover their gifts. So I think fathers and grandfathers can help children discover their gifts. So speaking of fathers, didn't wasn't John Paul II's father very influential in his life? John Paul II's uh, baptismal name was Carl, K-A-R-O-L, which means Charles in English. And that was what his father's name was too. And his father had been a military officer, career military officer. And after John Paul II's mother died, his father's role became even more important. His father was a very humble man and a very prayerful man, and he helped John Paul II grow in a life of prayer. They would pray the rosary together, go to Mass together. And something that really had a big impact on John Paul II was they lived in a small apartment and they shared the same bedroom. And so sometimes at night, John Paul II would wake up and he'd look across the room and he'd see us at three in the morning, he'd see his father kneeling at his bed, at the bedside, praying at three in the morning. That has a big impact on a nine, 10, 11, 12 year old boy to see their father on their knees praying to God. Absolutely. And I think more fathers need to not be embarrassed to show their children that they are prayerful. And it doesn't have to be uh, an organized prayer, just a, a conversation with God to to thank him for the gifts and maybe make a, a petition. So now that covers his youth. Did he Was he special as a teenager or a young adult? Uh, yeah, he was. What happened was he had another big loss in his life. He had an older brother uh, named Edmund who was over 10 years older than John Paul II. And when John Paul II was only 12, Edmund died in a yellow fever plague. And so now, you know, at the age of 12, it was just, uh, John Paul II and his father. and But as a teenager, he continued uh, acting and things like that. But then when he was 19, and see, John Paul II was born May 20th, 19, no, let's see, May 18th, 1920. And World War II began September 1st, 1939, when he was 19 years old. Then Nazis overran Poland, outlawed the church, and uh, many people were put into concentration camps. And the question that John Paul II faced was, how do I act in this situation? Some of his friends entered the underground military and fought that way. But John Paul II fought with what he called the power of the word. And so he, he fought with by praying. And then he they had this clandestine theater where they would 
at night perform patriotic plays and things like that to keep their faith and culture alive. And this was this really united him with the with his peers that did this. And they had a a man who was a tailor, a, a guy who was a bachelor named Jan Taranowski, who was maybe 40 years old. He taught Karl Wojtyla the theology of St. John of the Cross, the great Carmelite mystic. So that's pretty amazing that in your teenage years, you're learning about St. John of the Cross and applying it in your life. John Paul II practiced a resistance, what you'd call a spiritual and cultural resistance to the Nazi invasion. And he had a green card, so to speak. And so he worked from the age of 19 to throughout the war. He worked in a chemical factory and in a rock quarry. And so he learned the value of work. And when he went to work, he would carry a copy of the book, True Devotion to Mary, in his back pocket. And that's written by St. Louis de Montfort. And he started reading it, and he read it once and didn't quite understand it. So he read it again, and it was starting to make some sense. And by the third time, it all clicked. And basically, true devotion is about consecrating yourself to Jesus through Mary. You give the entire gift of yourself to Jesus through Mary's hands. And Mary, when you do that, Mary prays with you to Jesus so that when you do a good work on your own merit, you deserve 10 merit points, right? But because Mary's praying, praying with you, she draws it down a superabundance of grace that you ordinarily wouldn't be getting. And that's how you become a great saint, Gary, is consecrate yourself to Jesus through Mary, like John Paul II did when he was about 22 years old. And that became a huge turning point in his life. I think that's a, a great example. And so if you have young men or young women in your life, the sooner they, that concept, that practice comes to light in their heart and fires them up, their life is going to improve dramatically. Once people have that joyful yeah. consecration of Jesus through Mary, their life is going to take off like a skyrocket. It, it doesn't mean you'll drive a fancier car or a bigger house, but uh, you'll have more joy and more happiness in your life. When does he has to, when does he go to seminary? What happened was um, when he was still 20 years old, he wanted to be an actor, but it was shortly after that he did his consecration. And he said that was a turning point in his life because by the age of 22, he felt the call from God to become a priest. Now he's in the middle of World War II. The Nazis are all around him. They're putting people to death every day on the streets, firing squads, sending them off to concentration camps. So he actually became an underground seminarian hidden in the basement of the archbishop's palace. And that's where he would study for the priesthood. And he was risking his life every day as he did that, but God protected him because God had a big plan for uh, John Paul II's life. Yeah, and I think, as we said, the Holy Spirit prayer that there is a plan for us. We have to be open. We have to surrender and we'll be taken care of. And so that should give you a feeling of joy. You've brought up a several good topics that I think we're going to really flush out in uh, future episodes, and that is the consecration of Jesus through Mary, huh? the Rosary. Who's the author of that book again? I'm always mispronouncing his name. Uh, the one on consecration? St. Louis de Montfort. And I think if we go into a little bit more depth on him in the future, that will be extremely helpful. So, Father, We've covered a lot of ground in a short minute amount of time in this inaugural episode. I think this is going to be a world-famous radio program living in the heart of the most holy trinity. How do we apply? How do we, somebody's listening to this. Right. When we're done, what can they do? How do they transform their lives right after the show from what we've learned so far? Yeah, I think one thing is to realize that God has given us the gift of saints to be to accompany this through this life. Like, we're blessed. John Paul II lived in our lifetime. We, some of us met him personally. Almost all of us saw him on TV. And so he did wonderful things for the honor and glory of God while he was on earth. He can do even more from heaven. So he's aware. God lets John Paul II be aware of what we're doing. And you can become a personal friend to John Paul II. Maybe something that we've said today touched your heart about him. Like maybe you're someone who lost your mom or dad as a child. You don't have to let that dominate you. You can give that loss to Jesus and become an even closer spiritual child of Mary. Let Mary as your spiritual mother 
wrap you in her arms. Let her lead you to Jesus. Learn to pray the rosary and let Mary lead you to Jesus. And John Paul II wants to be your friend. Maybe you're a teenager and maybe you're in high school and maybe you're an athlete, right? And uh, you want to be a really good athlete. You could ask John Paul II to pray for you to be the best athlete that you could, but to have the goal to be a great athlete for the honor and glory of God. Like you've probably seen on TV, some of the professional athletes actually when they win it, like the Super Bowl, and they say, the first thing I want to do is praise God and thank him for giving me this gift. See, they're acknowledging that everything comes from God. When you and I live our life that way, Gary, we live free and we have joy. And that joy is what is really contagious. And I, I love the word joy. Bishop Barron recently gave a homily talking about you can be 100% right in your knowledge of your faith. You can be 100% accountable in attending Mass. But if you're not doing it with joy, you're missing the whole point. Catholicism is not about guilt. It's not about dogma. It's not about dreary chapels. It's about joyful love of Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you, this has been uh, a tremendous kickoff uh, episode of Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity. In the future, we'll have an email where you can send us either a voice memo or an email, and we'll answer your uh, questions live. So I think we've got enough material here just on St. John Paul II to go into the next level of his life, maybe in the next episode, Father. Right, Gary. And I'd like to invite our listeners, if you haven't already, maybe uh, purchase a used copy of uh, the famous biography on John Paul II called Witness to Hope, written by George Weigel. It basically came out in the late 1990s, and the Pope himself asked George to write this uh, biography of the Pope, and so John Paul II gave George access to all the people in the Vatican. And when George said to him, yeah, Holy Father, but how am I going to get answers from you? The Holy Father said, George, you write down your questions, and I'll write down my answers. And so one day, George through Pope John Paul II's secretary, gave the Pope a list of 20 questions, right? Within two weeks, George had all the answers back, handwritten by John Paul II. So it's a very definitive biography, and it'll really get you becoming a very good friend of Pope John Paul II. So do you want to wrap us up and maybe give our listeners a blessing with uh, yes. 30 seconds to go in this episode? Yes. So Lord Jesus... I entrust everybody listening to this show today and everyone who will ever listen to this show, I entrust them all to you, Jesus, through the loving hands of Mary. I ask you to guide them and protect them, heal and strengthen them. I ask you to show them, Lord, your gifts that you've given them and give them the grace to develop those gifts for your honor and glory and for the service of man. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of our faith. We thank you for the gift of your real presence in the Eucharist. And may Almighty God bless each one of you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that is your host, Father James Kelleher, the Rosary Priest, and I'm your co-host, Rear Admiral Gary Hall, the Curious Catholic. Learn more about the good news of our faith and how to become the perfect saint on living in the heart of the Most Holy Trinity. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Admiral's Almanac, where I introduce you to Living in the Heart of the Most Holy Trinity with Father James Kelleher, the Rosary Priest, and me, the Curious Catholic. If you have any questions or comments, email a voice memo to gary.hall at gmail.com, and you may find yourself on the air of the radio Catholic Radio Network. Again, that's gary with two r's dot hall at gmail.com. Email me a voice memo in your first name, and you may appear on our show. Until we meet again, here's wishing you a happy voyage home.